Well, good afternoon, G2GCC family and our internet family. You know, I just want to say it is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord because today is the day that the Lord has made and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. I just want to welcome you all to our Thursday noon Bible study. I am Minister Juliet Nance. I'm going to pray and we're going to get started. Amen. So if you will, just bow your heads with me. Dear Heavenly Father, today is the day that you have made and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. And as we gather again in your presence, you are God in heaven who made all the earth through your word. We exalt you for your power and goodness. We come to you to show our love for you and we cast all our cares before you and on you. So Father, let us be refreshed to you today. We thank you for counting us worthy to serve you and to know you as our only true loving God. Lord, we adore you. We love you. May we be guided by your light and mercy. We thank you for our pastor, Alfred D. Harvey Jr., and his lovely wife. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to minister here, uh, Lord God. And we just want to thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayers today. We know that without you, we can do nothing. Empower us to do great things today and every day. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. May grace mercy and peace from God our Father, Lord Jesus Christ, and our Savior be upon you, G2GCC, and our internet audience. Amen. Now, we have been teaching uh, on the book of Revelations. So uh, today I will be teaching uh, chapters 11 and 12. And if you like titles, the title of my message is The Two Witnesses. Now, my purpose is to bring to the hearer and the believer to examine the remaining vision in the interlude between the sounding of the six and seven trumpets and what happens when the seven trumpet sounds. And my goal is to uh, try to offer an, ex an explanation to the hearer and the believer concerning the significance of this vision. Uh, you know, the temple of God is what we're gonna be talking about and John is instructed to measure the temple, the altar, and its worshipers. So you know what? We're just going to get into chapter 11 and see what John is trying to tell us through these, uh, through these messages, I mean, through this chapter today. Amen. So let's get through it. And if you would, turn with me to chapter 11. And I'm going to start reading at verse 1, and we're going to read uh, down to verse 1 and 2. <clears throat> and it says, and there was given a reed and like unto a rod. And the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar in them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, but is given unto the Gentiles in the holy city, shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. Now, as we see here in chapters one, it talks about like uh, a reed is like measuring a rod because we see this in Ezekiel chapter 40 through uh, 40 and 43 is an extended passage where the temple is measured. Now the temple in Ezekiel uh, is best understood as the temple of the millennium earth in the temple of Revelations. We see that in 11 and it seems to be before the temple of Ezekiel, yet there are similarities. The temple in Ezekiel <clears throat> also is measured extensively, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> now the rod was a hollow bamboo-like cane plant that grew in Jordan Valley. Because it's light, light weighted rigidly, it was commonly used uh, as a measuring rod, measuring the temple, it, and what it did, it signified God's ownership. Now the angel was telling John to take the measurement of the temple and of the people. Now the temple of God refers to the Holy of Holies and the place, uh, not the entire temple complex. Now the statement about the temple, it says them that worship their ends is speaking of the true believers who collectively make up the temple, which is the body of Christ. Now we see the altar, this is in reference to worshipers and suggests this is the bronze altar in the courtyard and not the incense altar in the holy place, since only the priests were permitted to be inside the holy place. Amen. So we see in verse two, it says, a, a court is which is without. Now the court 
of the Gentiles was separated from the inner court. Now, the Gentiles were forbid, uh, forbidden to enter the inner court on the penalty of death. Now, and John was instructed not to measure the outer court because it symbolized God's rejection of the unbelieving Gentiles who have oppressed his covenant people. Now, we see that the outer court for the Gentiles means just this. The believer who is a Christian is named not only in deed, and the outer court is not the place for the believers to be. So what's so bad about it is that the unsaved who are believing that they will be saved, and they're not. Now, turn with me to 2 Timothy, and I'm going to read uh, verse 5. 2 Timothy 3, 5, and if you see me not turning my Bible, it's because I already have it written here on my page. And 2 Timothy 3, 5 says, Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, such turn away. So we see this is a faithless portion of the church. Now, if you read it in the Amplified Version, it says, uh, better in verse 5, it says, Holding to a form of what? Outward godliness, which is religion, Although they have denied his power, for their conduct nullifies their claim of faith. Avoid such people and keep far away from them. So this is to remind John, those so-called Christians that have brought compromise and pleasing of the flesh into God's church. Now this is why John uh, was made aware of the multitude of the true believers who will be in the very presence of God. Amen. So now let's just go ahead and go into verse 3. But first, in uh, the 40 and 2 months here is the three and a half period covers the second half of the tribulations and it coincides with the visible evil career of what? The Antichrist. But during the same time, the Jews will be sheltered by God in the wilderness. And we'll get in that in Revelations 12, verses 6 and 14. But now let's go to verse uh, 3. I'm going to read verses 3 to 6. And it says, I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees in the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceeded out of their mouth and devour their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he shall, he must in this manner be killed. Verse six says, these have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy and have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. So we see here that these two witnesses is the most interesting characteristics of Revelation. These two are what they are dressed in sackcloth and their character and their ministry is prophetic and they will prophesy. They preach and demonstrate repentance and they have an effective ministry. Now these two witnesses serve with power, such power in fact they are able to witness for 1,000 260 days. Now verse 4 goes on and they said that there are two olive trees in the two candlesticks standing before God on earth. Now these two witnesses have a unique continual empowering from Holy Spirit and their preaching will spark a revival. Now we see in verse 5 it talks about it says if any man will hurt them this is what's going to happen. The two witnesses have a special protection from God and they will be invincible during their ministry. They are protected by supernatural power from harm for three and a half years. There would be no doubt that these two witnesses will have the attention of the earth to repent and to acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the world's ruler, the the rightful ruler here on the earth, and that we should receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Amen. Now, verse talks about the power to shut up heaven. Now, these two witnesses have power over waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. Now, they have the power to bring drought and plague similar to the power in Elijah. Now, if you turn with me to James 3, I mean, excuse me, James 5, it talks about um, where Elijah, what he did. So let's go to James Get there. Now, 
I'm going to read James 5. And I'm going to read verses 17 and 18. And it says, And Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And 18, it says, And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. So we see here that as the two witnesses were able to stop and bring rain, we see that that's the second witness where James said that he would be, that Elijah would be able to do it as he did as well. So now let's go over into, let's go to uh, talk about the death of the two witnesses. And we see this in verses uh, Revelation 7 through 9. So I'm going to read, Revel I mean, I'm going to read uh, verses 7 through 10, excuse me, 7 through 10. And it says, and when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascended out of the, bottom, the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And their bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, with, which spiritually is called Sodom in Egypt, which also our Lord was crucified. And 9 says, and, and they of the people, kinders and tongues and the nations shall see the bodies for three days and a half, and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And verse 10 says, And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them, and make merry, and shall send gifts one to another, because these prophets tormented them that dwelleth on the earth. So we see uh, that uh, it says, Make war against them, shall overcome them, and kill them. Now the two witnesses are killed by the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit. And we see this in Revelation 9-11, who is most likely Satan himself, but their ministry is not cut short. They fully accomplished their task when they finished their testimony. So thank God that we, uh, that he will not leave the earth. Uh, we will not leave this earth until we finish our testimony. The devil does not have the power over our lives. We are witnesses of the Lord, and he will protect us until our testimony is finished. So we see that we all have a purpose, and we do have a testimony that God is relying on us to tell others that will bring uh, them to understand and get to know Jesus. So it's our responsibility to let people know who Jesus Christ is. Amen. Now let's go to verse 8. It talks about their bodies lie in the street. The two witnesses are killed in the city of Jerusalem which is described in three illustrated terms. It says, first, the great city. It identifies Jerusalem as the city of Sodom and Egypt. It stresses that the cities of its wickedness, but its Jewish population would apparently be focused of the witnesses ministry leading to the conversions. In verse nine, it talks about the three days and a half that the entire world will watch either by the latest form of visual media, social media, Facebook, uh, Instagram, all these places, they would see them this day and time in the glory of the Antichrist as the bodies of the dead prophets to have been killed began to decay because they'd be laying there for three days. And these bodies would be lying in the street in great scorn and contempt even to, re to, even to rejection. So we see now that those who dwell on the earth rejoice, make merry, send wild gifts with joy over the death of their tormentors. Those who dwell on the earth, and we see this phrase is done several times in Revelation where it says, those who dwell on the earth to speak of unbelievers will celebrate the two witnesses' death as a holiday. But it's amazing how we are going to be amazed to see these bodies that are laying in this um, street for three days and they start de decaying. But now we're going to read in verse 11 through 14 that it talks about the reviving of the two witnesses. So I'm going to read verses 11, uh, 11 through 14. And it says, And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them. It says, The spirit of life of God entered into them and they stood up upon their feet. Wow, that's going to be amazing. And great fear fell upon them which saw them. 
And then they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither and ascend up to heaven in the cloud. And their enemies beheld them. In the same hour was there a great, a great earthquake. The tenth part of the city fell, and the earthquake was slain of men, seven thousand, and the remnant was affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. The verse 14 says, The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. So we see here, like we said, this is the reviving of the two witnesses. The spirit of life from God entered into them. God himself breathed breath and the spirit in the church and looked look out for this power. You thought the church had power before. You cannot imagine the renewed power of the church will have now once these two witnesses are revived. Amen. So we're going to continue on and see in verse uh, 12, because matter of fact, when God breathed into the two witnesses, what they do, they stood on their feet, great great fear fell upon all those that saw them. And as before the eyes of watching the world, the enemy of these two witnesses, are, they're even horrified and astonished that they, he, they couldn't keep them down, that God raised them up, amen. And verse 12 says, as they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, some wonder why God would not allow them to preach, assuming their message would have more force following their resurrection. Now this great voice from heaven this that calls to come upon hither is the Lord's, and it is when the trumpet of redemption blows. So Jesus has uh, always been inviting us what to come. The outer come of the church is the the outcome of the church is following Jesus in his resurrection. So we should be witnessing to people. We should reach in the lost. Amen. The living forever in the presence of God is the outcome. Uh, of our true believers after they have run the race and been victorious. Amen. So like I said, we have a purpose and a goal. If you don't know that, that is to reach the lost and bring them into the body of Christ. Amen. And we see in verse 13, it talks about an earthquake brings judgment and move many to uh, give glory to God. God loses no time dealing with those who have rejected the Lord or even those who have said, I will straighten up later. Hey, that may be too late. God said, now is, the, now is the time to straighten up, to come and acknowledge him as their Lord and Savior. And we see here that one-tenth of the people lose their life in this earthquake. Amen. And then they talk about the remnant. It is referred to the Jews still living who will not yet have come to faith in Christ. Now we talk about verse 14. It talks about the second woe has passed, but these things are about to get even worse. But Revelation is written for believers, the church, and the believers would not see uh, the third woe. Now let's go ahead and read verses, uh, verses 15. I'm going to read verses 15 through 19. It says, And the seven angels sounded, and there were a great voice in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are becoming the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign for whatever and ever. And the four twenty elders, which is set before God in their seats, fell upon their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which are the waste and are to come, because thou hast taken to see thy great power that has reigned. And the nations were angry, and they raft is come in the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, prophets and to the saints them that fear thy name shall small and great and shouldest destroy them with the, which destroy the earth and verse 19 says and the temple of god was open in heaven and there was seen in his temple the art of his testimony and there were lightnings and voices of thundering and the earth great and a great hell so as we go on and see that the seventh Trumpet results in the establishment of the Manilium kingdom of Christ. And the seven vows or vows are probably contained in judgment of the seven trumpets. And the kingdom of this world will be completely overthrown by the coming kingdom of Christ who will reign forever and ever. So Jesus, uh, he will take over this earth and reign with the believers as his subordinates. Uh, Jesus will return as what? King of kings and Lord of lords, and that's going to be a great day. Amen. Because in 1 Thessalonians, 
uh, 3.13, it says, To the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Now, verse 16, it talks about the four and 20 elders, and this represented all of the believers, and they have something to praise about. They were spared the wrath of God, hallelujah, and it sure was time to fall on their face in total adoration to God, amen. So that's what we're going to be doing when we get to heaven, giving praise to God, amen. And also, verse 17, we give the thanks. These thanksgiving isn't to thank God that he's already what he's already done, but the hour has come for us to take place and that these things are permanently set in motion. So we see here that Jesus took power in establishing of his kingdom and the final victory to the Christians. Now, verse 18 says the nations were angry. The nations are angry with God and he responds with wrath. Those that destroy the earth are themselves destroyed. Now the nations are angry because God comes to rule. And the world wants anything but the reign of God, as it says in the parable of Jesus. We will not have this man to reign over us. And we see that in Luke 19, 14. Now verse 19 says, God's temple in heaven was open in the beginning of Revelation 11. John witnesses the temple of God on earth being measured. Now we find the temple in heaven being open to John. Now the art of his covenant was seen was seen within this temple because the art is mentioned here and it indicates that God will soon faithfully fulfill his covenant promise to Israel and that represented by the ark. And there were flashes of lightning and rumbling, peals of thunder and earthquakes and the heavy, heavenly hail. Now, these verses address both heaven and earth. This great, awesome phenomenal at the opening of the temple and the revelation art show the presence of the Lord is there. And it is a reminisce of God's manifest presence at Mount Sinai. If you want to reference something, you can see that in Exodus 19, verses 16 through 19. But one thing we are, we are reassured that God's covenant uh, will uh, never fail us. Amen. And that's awesome to know that. Now I'm going to go ahead and get into my chapter two. Now this chapter, um, excuse me, chapter 12. Now chapter 12, uh, we're going to talk about the woman, the child, and the dragon. Now Revelations chapter 12, 13, and 14, the main figure of the great tribulations are described in these three great introductions of the first of the seven. And that is the woman, she represents Israel, the dragon representing Satan, the man-child is referring to Jesus, the angel Michael, the head of the angelic host, the offspring of the woman representing Gentiles who come to faith in the tribulations, the beast out of the sea representing the Antichrist, and the beast out of the earth represents the false prophet who promotes the Antichrist. And this is what all this chapter 12, 13, and 14 is going to be talking about. Amen. So I'm going to start reading verse 12, and I'm going to read verse, uh, start at 1 and 2, and it says, <clears throat> And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth, in pain to be delivered. And uh, in verse 3 says, And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great, excuse me, a great red dragon having seven heads, ten horns, and seven crowns upon their heads. Uh, now we see that in uh, verse, uh, excuse me, in verse 2, it, I mean, in verse 1, it talks about a great sign appeared in heaven, and that which is the woman. And the woman, what, represents Israel and the wife of God. The moon allures to God's covenant, and that's the relationship with Israel. Now, verse 2 goes on to say that the woman, what, she gives birth. And it's clear that the child born of Israel is what? It's Jesus. And the pain described refers to the travail of Israel at the time of Jesus' birth. Now, verse 3 talks about the dragon. And it's a fearful, powerful dragon that appear. we are reminded that this is a sign in the creatures 
here are not just a great fiery red dragon, but the dragon represents the nature and the character. And this description suggests the fierce power and the murderous nature and the picture of the fullness of evil and all its hideous strength in Satan. Now, the seven heads and the ten horns claim royal authority. Now, the crowns represented his uh, presumptive claim of royal authority <coughs> against the true king. And the seven heads <coughs> and the uh, seven crowns apparently refer to the principal rule of his empire. Now, we go on and read verses four through six, <coughs> and it says, And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them into the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, but to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man child who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness and where she had a place prepared of God and they should feed her there a thousand and two hundred and three scores a day. So we hear in verse four, it talks about his tail uh, drew a third of the stars of heaven. Many believe this described one third of the angelic host in league with Satan, which is his angels, which it says of, shows us in Revelation 12, nine. Now, verse 5, it talks about Jesus' ministry is described by its earthly beginning and end. A male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Clearly, this is refers to Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And a male child, we know, is Jesus. So this means that the woman of Revelation 12, 1 cannot be talking about the church because Jesus gave birth to the church, not, not, not that other way around. So we see that the woman, uh, she was not the church because Jesus gave birth to the church. Amen. In verse six, it talks that the woman fled into the wilderness and she was persecuted by the dragon. The woman was what protected by God as he prepared a place for 1,200 and 60 days. This 1,260 days ref, ref, re, a reference to the three and a half uh, year period that connects these events for the final seven years in Daniel's prophecy. Amen. Now we're going to go ahead and read verses uh, seven through eight, and we're going to talk about the conflict in heaven. So verse seven, <clears throat> excuse me, says, and there was war in heaven, and Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found in any more in heaven. So we see now war has erupted in heaven between God's holy angels and the evil angels. Michael, the archangel, leads God's angels, and Satan leads the following angels. And then verse 8 talks about Satan and his fallen angels are no match to God's heavenly angel hosts by the leadership of our Arch, archangel of Michael, he was defeated and there was no place for them in heaven. Hallelujah. We know he was cast out. Amen. So we see that Michael is fighting for us and he is God's angel. Now we go on and we're going to read verses. Um, I'm sorry, in verse nine, uh, we did talk about that the, uh, the Satan and his angels are what cast out of heaven and the single verse uses many different titles for a spiritual enemy, and that includes, he was called a dragon, serpent of old, the devil, Satan, and he would deceive the whole world. But let's see what verses 10 through 12 tells us. And verses 10 says, And I heard a loud voice, excuse me, and I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused him before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony and the love, not their lives unto death. Therefore rejoice ye heavens, and yet that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth of, of the sea, for the devil is come not unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he have but a short time. In verse 13, it goes on to say, And when the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. Verse 14 says, And to the woman were given two wings of great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she nourished for a time, 
in times of half a time before face of the serpent, and the serpent cast out of his mouth water as flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the, dra uh, the dragon cast out of his mouth. And verse 17 says, And the dragon was wrought with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the covenant of God and having the testimony of Jesus. So we see here, <clears throat> verse 10, it talks about the joyful decoration in heaven. And it says, I heard a loud voice saying, whoever is behind this loud voice, it is some representative of redemptive humanity, not an angel or God, because the voice speaks of the accuser, of our brethren. And then it also, the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down who accuses them day and night. So Satan's continuous job is just accusing God's people. He does this in two ways. First, he accused the believers before the throne of God. And second, he accused believers to their own conscience, causing excessive guilt in order to bring depression and defeat. But verse 11 says, what? They overcame him by what? The blood of the lamb, the blood overcomes Satan and his accusations. Those accusations mean nothing against us because Jesus has already paid the penalty for our sins that we deserved, that we did not deserve, but he paid the penalty for us by the word of their testimony. The word of the testimony overcomes Satan's de deceptive knowing and re reminding and remembering the work of God in life protects them against Satan's deception. So we see why the cross is so important that what died, what Christ did for us when he died on the cross. So we see that we should not never forget what he did when he died and took all those stripes on his back for us. Amen. Now, faithful witness openly witnessed about Jesus during the tribulation period. They did not back down for witnessing in the face of death threats. They would rather give up their lives than deny Christ. Here, we as Christians are told to, to look up, rejoice when we see things happening because our redemption draw nigh. Satan realized his time is running out. Satan is working on believe, believers, trying to convert them to his way. He's trying to make us not take God seriously, and he does not, rem, uh, he does not mind going to many churches. Watering down Jesus is only Satan's favorite tool which is to destroy the church. But we have to be mindful of what his tactics are and to stand up and do our rightly part and speak boldly for Jesus. Amen. And then we see in verses 13, 16, Satan attacks the woman and God protects her. Our Satan was kicked out of Satan was kicked out of heaven, thrown down to earth. He seeks to persecute the Jews from those lineages of the Messiah was born. He persecuted the woman, which brought forth the man child. But the child is represented as safe, but the ultimate progress and extension of the church was certain. But Satan was permitted to wage a war warfare against the church, represented here by the wrath against the woman and by her being constrained to flee into the wilderness. But wings of great evil, not actually birds, but a graphic depiction of God's protection of Israel, wings represented sweep escape from persecution. It says cast out of mouth, it says cast out of his mouth as a flood. This is a corrupting judgment in, of several persons who out of the abundance of air in their hearts preach corrupt doctrine. Water is the symbolic of the word of God. This is crazy because the water was coming out of the, the serpent's mouth. Some commentators identify the river as lies that comes out of Satan's mouth, while others see the river as a flood of persecution upon the church. Now we see in verse 16, it says, the earth helped the woman by opening and taking in what the serpent cast out so it could not reach the woman and angry and ignored her. But the earth came to the aid of the Jews. We see this in uh Isaiah 54, 7, which says, No weapon that is formed against them shall prosper. Every tongue shall rise against them in judgment. Shall thou condemn this is the heritage of the servant of the Lord and the righteousness of the saints of the Lord. And cast out his mouth and great army that comes against Israel. Uh, 
Israel like a flood to be swallowed up. So in, 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 in essence to this, we see that my time is running out. So I just encourage you to really get in to study um, these scriptures out. But because of the remnant of the woman, see, Satan is frustrated, turned his rage against every followers of uh, the Lord and the Jews and the Gentiles. Satan cannot get to Jesus, so he's venting anger uh, to the followers of Jesus. But we see the remnant may uh, reference either to the Jewish believers who have uh, refused to worship Satan and his beast and the Gentiles and believers who are seed. Abraham through Jesus Christ. So these are the remnants. So like I said in summary, um, that uh, the, in, the interlude between the six and seven trumps continues through the visions. The first one involves John himself and given the reed and, and told to measure the temple and the altar. And the second vision was of the two witnesses who falls in two, three sections, which they prophesied for 1,260 days and they're identified as the two olives and the two lamps standing before the throne of God, and also the power to stop the rain during the days of their prophecy, to turn water and strike the earth with plague. So I thank you right now that we had this opportunity. But in chapter 12, we learned that Satan was primarily the force behind the persecution that was about to befall God's temple. I mean, God's people. So Satan was frustrated being... Uh, Dwarf at every turn, he was cast down to the earth and would attempt to destroy the disciples of Jesus, but he cannot, he does not have that power. Amen. So let's just give God glory today for the message. Amen. Now, like I said, we don't want to leave this message, I mean, leave this Bible study without allowing you. If you've not had an opportunity to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, now is the time because John, Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in the heart that God is raising from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made. So if you would repeat this prayer after me. Dear God in heaven, I come to you in the name of Jesus. Your word said, him that cometh to me, I will no wise cast out. So I know you won't cast me out, but you take me in. And you said in your word, if I shall confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in my heart that God is raising from the dead, I shall be saved. I'm confessing with my mouth. I believe in my heart that Jesus is the Son of God. He was raised from the dead for my justification, and I receive him right now as my Lord and Savior. Thank you, Father, for saving me right now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So we thank you that you had this opportunity to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. We'd like to hear from you at the bottom of our screen. We have a number that you can call and let us know about your, your experience after you have received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That number is 314-867-1894. Now, this would have been like to do a benediction over you. Now, God of peace, they're brought again from the dead. Our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make us perfect in every good work to do his will, working in us that just as well pleasing. In his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Be blessed and have a wonderful day. Amen.